Yes, over to you, Anish. All right. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming and uh, on a Saturday morning. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, I'm going to try and keep this a little um, interesting, but uh, and and talk about our journey as to how we figured out um, to make sunglasses from packets of chips. Uh, and thanks, Das Mafia, for having uh, for having me and for all the support you've given to uh, the years. So I think the first question was like, why packets of chips, right? And um, when I started down on this journey, did a lot of research on, you know, on poverty and on waste and came across the waste management space and got very intrigued for many reasons. And when I started researching the waste management space, found out that about 62 million tons of waste produced a year, um, uh, according to like, the, uh, the data out there. And then obviously there's an environmental effect, like 50% of it ends up in landfills, you know, 50% is wet. Ten, only 10% is plastic, out of which I found out 60% is recycled. Also found out that only uh, 5 to 6% is composted when it comes to wet waste. And then you have 7% recyclables and e-waste and, and municipal solid waste uh, and like inert waste. 30% was inert waste. So like I started learning more about the waste management space. Uh, but then I also learned this whole other elephant in the room, right? It was not just an environmental problem in India. It was also a social problem and an economic problem. We had like 1.5 to 4 million waste pickers who lived really poor lives. And it was all interconnected, right? Because 40 to 60% of like their income was uh, of waste pickers comes from plastic waste. So it was like, it was like, how oh, this problem is, is really complex, really interconnected. It was also an economic loss of value. Then there's this whole bioplastic movement, which is exciting, but it's more complex. It's not as straightforward uh, uh, as, as we might imagine. So I did a lot of research uh, in this space. Um, and then we, you know, we were like, okay, this is interesting, but let's kind of narrow in on plastics because it's easier to start off with working on plastics. So we're like, let's look at the plastic space. We looked at plastic and we found out that 60% is recycled. But this was mainly like the high quality stuff, right? Like PET or mono materials like HDPE um, were ben generally recycled. Like I think 90% of PET bottles in India are recycled. Um, uh, and then the 40% that was not recycled, we started, you know, we dug into that and we found that it mainly comprises like metallized multi-layer plastic packaging. And this is considered impossible to recycle because it contains like three to five different layers. So there's an aluminum layer inside. There, um, two, uh, you know, there are like two or three plastic layers outside. Sometimes there's cellulose. So this is really like hard to recycle. Um, uh, and and they all fuse together. So you know, like and and they're also inconsistent. So like a a lace cut chips packet has a different composition than a chocolate wrapper. That has a different composition than uh, you know those like milk uh, not milk pouches those um. Uh, detergent pouches you get to refill your uh, your your detergent stuff. So, so it was also it was very uh, complex and nobody recycled this. Right? So we're like, okay, let's try and work on this. It's honestly the worst. Um, and then I think off, based on all my research, I found that the we realized I realized that we need to fundamentally increase the value of waste uh, that was not generally recycled. And I think when you fundamentally increase the value of waste, that it, uh, you know you create incentives um, uh, that allow to you know that puts a lot of wheels into motion. Um, so that's what we. Uh, that's what I uh, realized. But I'm like, listen, I'm, I'm a finance guy. I know nothing about chemistry and nothing about plastic. Uh, so, you know, I wanted to kind of, the first person I was looking for to hire or to get on board was somebody who got this. Um, and then enter Dr. Jitendra Jitu Samdani, right? So Jitu has been with me since the beginning and, and he has a PhD in electrochemistry. And I thought this would be a good combo, right? It was him and me uh, just starting off uh, with this idea that hey, you have to recycle MLP because nobody else is recycling it. So let's try something. And, and Jitu was finishing his PhD in, in Korea at this point. So he was like not even moved back to India. It was, the, it was the middle of the pandemic. So he, there was like so much uncertainty, but he was really excited because he was, he want, his wife and his child were in Pune. So he wanted to start a life in Pune. Uh, so he was excited, but like we were all nervous. There was so much uncertainty in Korea. His like his professors were like giving him, I mean, that's a different story that Jitu can maybe talk to you about, but it was, there was a lot of uncertainty, but we're like, hey, let's do this uh, and let's try. Um, uh, and it's so funny. I still remember that Jitu was sitting in, in Korea in his room. And I think he, he, he did his, we did our first experiment in Korea and we got some luck at it. And this is a slide from December 2020 that we pitched to our advisors back then. Uh, I was just pitched, just kind of explaining about MLP. And we had this initial, they had one slide in, in this deck from 2020. And it was an at-home experiment. And Jitu had done this, right? He'd, he'd taken a lace packet. I don't know how, he found a lace packet with magic masala in Korea. He's like, I have to try this one because India may void hai. Uh, and he cut it into pieces. Um, and then he soaked it in his magic solution. <laughs> it was not really magic, it was just an alpine solution. And he left it there for 16 hours. And then suddenly he saw that the aluminum disappeared. There was some layer separation. 
um, and you know, uh, and then you know we we saw visible layer separation, we saw some degradation, there was some faint color, and this became really really uh, exciting and interesting, and we're like, oh, very cool. Um, and we obviously there were limitations, and learnings. We're like, this is too simple. First experiment we did, you know, whatever. But I remember presenting this slide to our advisors who were like PhD in chemistry and like you know working in the sustainability space, and they were really blown away. They were super surprised. Uh, so when they were shocked and they were surprised, and wow, we, then we're like, oh, maybe there's something we have here. But I mean, this is just the beginning. I mean, this is not the technology we use now. I mean, it's similar, but it's like there's a lot more uh, we do than just this. But it was that this was the start. Like this was in December 2020, and then you know, G2 made it, <laughs> made it somehow to India. He had to go through Dubai. He had to like there was a special flight he had to take from Korea because it was in the middle of. Uh, it was in the middle of uh, the pandemic, so they weren't letting people fly. So we made it, and we got like a. You know, we tried to get lab space in like different incubation centers here, but it didn't. It nothing really worked out. So we ended up just you know finding a small place where we could set up tables and and have stirrers. You can see we have a little weighing balance there. We have a little stirrer, and this was. Uh, so we moved into a little lab, uh, uh, and uh, and then you know our, our technology slowly, slowly started increasing and improving. We started iterating on. Well, we started quantifying what we had done, right? So, you know, with the chemical separation stuff that we, we <coughs> from May 2021, right? So we've made progress. This slide is an actual slide from May 2021. Uh, we were at that space and uh, we were like, um, you know, we think this is patentable, this is interesting. We separate out the layers, the and, and and then we continued iterating and there was lots of like things that happened, but long story short, um, anyway, so what we found was that, yeah, like, you know, whatever, there's, there's multiple layers. Um, and we were, I remember back then, we were trying to convert this material into 3D printing filament because we were very in interested in, in doing 3D printing. 3D printing, thought that was the future. And if you convert it to 3D printing filament, that becomes a base for, you can, there are multiple applications. And plus, 3D printing filament is very high quality filament, so high quality material. So when it started to make a lot of sense, oh, at least we tried back then and things have changed and we'll, we'll, go, we'll get to that. Uh, and then anyway, so our tech evolved. Finally, we, you know, we were at the point where we figured out the first step, which was like, we took this MLP, you know, uh, and through our, now we've already filed for a patent, which has been published. So we're excited about that. Hopefully we get it granted soon in the next few months. Uh, but uh, but in, this, in, this, in this first step, what our technology does, just for, you know, just for you guys to understand, is that the, the MLP gets demetallized. And then PET, which is polyethylene terephthalate, gets like extracted out. Um, and this is important because it's an aromatic compound, um, and an aromatic compound collides with aliphatic. So when you put, when you if you put this, if you put PET and pe uh, and pe polypropylene polyethylene etc. together in a melt, it will cause. I mean, it, it causes like, severe degradation. So the extraction of the PET was really important as well. Also gets partially laminated, and then we also using you know using centrifugal force, we separate out the cellulose and other heavy contaminants, including PVC. So it, it really gets separated out and we get, um, you know, we get two building blocks from it. We got a mix of polyolefins, which was PP plus PE. And this was consistent, right? Now, till today, we're getting a consistent mix of PP plus PE. Uh, and that's um, something that, that was the first thing that we got. That's about 70%, 60 to 70% of the MLP. And then we also got 20 to 30% of this monomer of PET, which is called terthalic acid, which is this white powder, right? So this was the first step we figured out. We're like, oh, this is exciting. So, you know, this is the slide that was developing. What we do, we take out, you know, we can mechanically extract materials from, from MLP. We make it into molecular building blocks and raw materials. But then what, right? Step two. We're like, what do we do in step two? Like, we have, you know, we have these things now. Now, what do we do? So, step two was enter Ashoka. And Ashoka is a really important person in all our lives right now. Uh, and that times well. I'm going to play a quick video from a slide that was back then, November 2021. So, Ashoka is our, one second, let me mute this. Uh, Ashoka one second, is our twin screw extruder. Um, and uh, this was one of the biggest investments we made. We'd never looked at a twin screw extruder before. Because in the middle of pandemic, this was like, uh, we got it in November, but we ordered it in May of 2021. Um, so we, we didn't know, you know, and we, it came, it was supposed to come in, no, we ordered it in February, March 2021. It was supposed to come in June. It came like three months, two months late. So we got it only in November. Uh, so it was a really you know, important uh, milestone for us. Um, and uh, and we'd never seen one before because it was really hard to find one. Uh, I think especially when we were researching it, things were locked down. Uh, and uh, and these aren't easily available, especially lab scale to inspire shooters aren't easily available. Uh, some of the entrepreneurs might be, uh, who work in the space might be able to attest, <laughs> attest to that. Um, anyway, so then 
hundred and so what you're going to inspire today is you put a bunch of recipes for compounding, right? Uh, so we had this polyol polyolefin mix, PP plus PE. And we had this twin screw extruder, and we you know we've never used it before, so you know uh, we learned it from scratch. Uh, and this was at the same time like our initial first technology was still being developed, right? So G2 was working on the first app, and we were trying to find a polymer engineer. We couldn't find a polymer engineer. So the amount of plastic books that I think I read in this period of time, uh, the amount of papers we researched and read, the amount of like things we learned uh, was really amazing. So 196 recipes later. Or some 300 experiments uh, later, we finally reached the next step uh, uh, of our of our uh, of our process, where we converted this polyolefin mix. We compounded it into high quality material and filament that was um, we were getting it consistently. We were getting close to virgin like properties, and it was a lot of work went in even that second step, right? Um, which we now also are in the process of starting to patent. Um, so so that was the genesis, right? So we got the first step, and we we're like, okay, Abusco, we have to. Take it to the next step where we have to pelletize it, um, and so that was going on. And then parallel, G2 was also working on the repolymerization of the PET, uh, which is also another story for maybe another talk because this this technology is still in process, and we're super excited about this because it breaks down it breaks it down into its monomer, and then we can repolymerize it to virgin PET, uh, and that way it's a true infinite loop. Um, and and it's a very simple process. We don't use anything very complex, um, especially like our depolymerization is a water based. Um, uh, alkaline hydrolysis process, so it's not really uh, complex. Uh, you know, we use catalysts, etc., um, um, and uh, it's, it's it happens at 120 degrees Celsius, so it's not like super energy intensive. It happens in four hours. Uh, so if you know, so both these processes are like, I mean, they're a little expensive right now, but at scale, we think we can definitely bring the the uh, bring the uh, bring the price down, and we're working on that uh, on our daily basis. And also, it's super water intensive. But we, you know, but we've been able to recycle all the water we use and reuse, reuse it again in in the reaction. So, and now we're going to see how many times we can reuse the water, uh, and also we're reducing the amount of water that's being used. Yitu just did an experiment yesterday, I think last week, where we got like we reduced the water by like sixty percent how much we needed to use. So we still have some ways to go. We can reduce it by another twenty thirty percent is what we think. Um, so so it's a, it's okay. It's not like carbon zero, but it's still much cleaner than like a pyrolysis, which you know is burnt at really high, you know, six hundred degrees Celsius, seven hundred degrees. Celsius. So. Um, and we haven't done the carbon footprint LCA yet, so we are, you know, we'll, we'll kind of try to do that uh, when we get the time. Uh, but yeah, so but this this bottom technology, we're really excited about that as well. Let's see, uh, you know, uh, hopefully that's what what's coming in the next phase. So now, step one done, step two done. We've compounded this into high quality materials, and now it's like, now what? Like, you know, we realized that our process wasn't cheap, so you know, if it costs us two hundred, three hundred rupees a kilo right now to make material, no one's gonna buy this material for. 400, 500 rupees a kilo. So we knew that we had to, especially with MLP, especially for starters, go to product, right? Um, and um, and first we're thinking of 3D printing, 3D printing um, products and 3D printing filament. And quickly realized that even the art of pulling a 3D printing filament is really complex and really hard. And it's something that I still aspire to, and we will at some point crack that as well. But right now it didn't make sense to let perfect be the enemy of good uh, because again the material is inconsistent. So you know you, with, with 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 3D printing filament, if you guys are familiar, you need like extremely uh, uh, you need like really good, uh, really like really high amount of consistency, um, and also like, it's not just the material; it's also the process, the way you pull it, like and you know the way you, uh, you know, we, it's it's really complex, and we can talk about that later if you have questions. But yeah, so step three, we're like, okay, we're getting the product, so um, you know, we can't do three D printing filament. Let's try something else, which is more conventional. So enter Sadhguru Junior and Sadhguru Senior, um, which are our injection molding machines. Uh, uh, and then also a high-end 3D printer, which I'll talk about in a second. So Sadhguru Junior is a is a hand molding machine. They don't make these anymore. But with the guy we we asked to make the Sadhguru Senior, which is a more industrial vertical top-down injection molding machine, we're like, please, can you make us a hand molding machine? He's like, why? Yeah, no one makes any. I'm like, no, please, because for R and D, a hand molding machine was much easier, right? Because we need to use just small amounts of material. So we got both of these, which were you know really helpful. And we also got a 3D printer because what we were really excited about was we wanted to change the we wanted to. In, Increase the speed of manufacturing. So we were like, "Hey, can we do 3D printed molds instead of conventional, um, conventional metal molds?" And so, uh, and you know, we read, I mean, read a lot of white papers on this, and and you know, it's still very new this technology. So, but we experiment like crazy on this, right? And we had like a full three to six months where we did this in our lab, and we got some success. So here is like our first. I don't know if I can if you can see this clearly, but so this is um, our mold, right? Uh, uh, this is like a the casing for our injection mold. And this is like a 3D printed insert. This wasn't from our recycled materials. This was like high engineering grade plastic, uh, but this was 3D printed in our lab. So we designed the mold in our lab. We designed the um, the sunglasses in our lab. Everything was done in house. We didn't outsource anything. 
Um, and, uh, uh, and yeah, so, and, and our first prototype, uh, these, are, these are frames for some, <laughs> from sunglasses, came from a 3D printed mold. So we were super, the first test we did on this, we got like super, we were super excited. We like, we can get a hundred shots, a thousand shots from, uh, from uh, this. Uh, and I think, uh, and then this was like, you know, this is Suraj and these are frames. These are our first ever frames made from cyclosha material using a 3D printed injection mold. This was in August. This is from an August 2002 board deck um, slide. Uh, and this is Suraj. Suraj is the absolute rock star in our company. Like he is the reason why, you, I mean, if you have bought sunglasses, the reason you're getting sunglasses uh, is in time is because of him. He's like, he's an absolute legend. Um, um, so yeah, so he, uh, so this was our first sunglasses, the first frame from upcycle or Shia material. Um, but then we quickly realized that, you know, we printed a lot of this, these molds and, and 3D printed a lot of these molds. We realized that they kept breaking, it kept breaking. We were not getting more than 20, 30 shots. And this was a big, like, failure and a lot of investment and a lot of money and time and effort into getting this right again in house not very few people in the world are doing this uh, successfully uh, but we learned a lot and i mean and but but then we realized that this is not going to work so we made the choice of switching from 3d printed in metal uh, inserts to metal inserts um because we we looked we asked like uh, a metal man i mean um, a cnc machine guy close to us like hey, how much are you going to take if we give you the design because we're doing all the designs and he's like, oh, it'll just cost you like, you know, not very much. The same amount that it was costing us to make to 3D print this uh, in our lab. It was the same amount, almost the same amount he was taking from us, right? It was a little bit more maybe, but very slightly more. The only catch was he would take like two, three, four weeks to make it. And this would happen in like one week in our lab, you know, after the post processing and everything. So that was the only catch. But like the, from a cost perspective, we thought we would be saving money because moles cost a lot of money, but just the inserts were great. So what we learned from this is that, hey, we learned like, even though we were trying to get 3D printed molds, we ended up still learning how to design molds and modular injection molding, which is something that we're really excited about. Um, um, so yeah, so then we got, we, we got even closer. This was an actual prototype. This was from November, 2022. And we were like so close to launching. We're like, we can do this, but yet so far, like, because the manufacturing process is really complex. And, um, you know, there's like grooving and hinging of the sunglasses, like the holes and then the hinging on the side, the hinges and lens cut, having the lenses and, Printing the damn QR code onto the side was really hard. And then the logo, the polishing, the assembly, the quality of the material, the packaging, there was so much, right? And I think at this point, a lot of our mentors, maybe you are thinking like, Anish, why the hell are you trying to reinvent sunglasses? Why don't you just outsource this? Why don't you get somebody else to make it? So we did try to explore some of those uh, options. And this is the kind of questions and answers we, I mean, answers we got. Right? We're like, hey, can you, we wanted to manufacture some sunglasses, uh, you know, can you help? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have a mold? I'm like... Not yet, but we're working on it. They're like, okay, okay, we can lend you a mold. Okay, uh, uh, what material do you want to use? Uh, cellulose acetate. They're like, no, no, we have our own recycled material that we want to use. Then they started laughing at us. They're like, no, 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 we're not gonna put some unknown recycled material from chips packets in our machines. Uh, so that's not gonna happen. And then even if we convince them on that, they're like, how many quantities do you want? How many? And they were like, about five hundred, because you know we can't afford five thousand or whatever. They're like, then they laughed at us even more. Uh, and they're like, no, no, we can't do. You know, minimum order is five thousand. Start realizing that you know, as an entrepreneur, people keep saying how out now. You know, it's very easy for people sitting who are not entrepreneurs or who don't know much about this space to be like, "Ha, outsource kar do." But then you, when you get into the space, you start realizing this is a lot more complex and not easy. Um, um, anyway, uh, so long story short, we kind of cracked this over the last few months, um, and then in February of 2023, we did launch our sunglasses and our coasters. Everything was designed in house. Everything was manufactured in house. Obviously. The, the mold was manufactured. I mean, we designed the mold in-house. We got somebody else to manufacture it. But like the actual sunglasses uh, manufactured, everything happens in-house. Um, um, so yeah, and, and we launched our brand uh, uh, into the, uh, in, in February, on February 16th. Uh, and the new brand is without. Uh, and you guys can look that up if you're interested. And what's really unique about a model, which I haven't even spoken about yet, and I'll talk about it a little later, is that 50 to 75% of uh, our process can be done by waste pickers. And that's something that's personally really important to me um, and, uh, and, and our work as well. Like, especially in waste management, like you have to be inclusive. You cannot, you know, like, I don't think waste picking should exist as an occupation, but there, but if you're displacing waste pickers, it has to be positive displacement. I mean, that's my philosophy. Uh, and that's what we at Ashaya also espouse. Um, and then also like, we want like just from our USP perspective, our technology, um, increases the recyclability of the material. So, I mean, some of you who understand this space, the current solutions with, uh, with MLP or flexible packaging is waste to energy, where you burn it for energy, uh, or spiralysis, where you burn it in the absence of oxygen to produce fuel, um, and you mix it with concrete cement um, to make like bricks and roads and sometimes furniture. And, um, um, but all of these 
again, all of these are good solutions. I don't want to hate on these solutions. They're all good solutions. It's better doing this than throwing it into the landfill. But they're all end-of-life solutions, not great economics, very volume-centric, uh, and some of them just delay the inevitable, right? Um, what we're doing is that we're chemomechanically extracting materials from the MLP, um, uh, and we're getting and, and we're releasing them back into the economy as more recyclable materials. So our repet would be like infinitely recyclable, which we're still working on. But our enhanced polyolefins is still not perfect. It's two material. There's polypropylene, there's polyethylene. It's definitely more recyclable than the first MLP, which has aluminium and sometimes cellulose and all kinds of inconsistent shit. Uh, but it's still not perfect, right? But we do not want perfect to be the enemy of good. And, and also polyolefins nowadays have like, they have similar processing parameters. They're not very miscible, but they're similar processing parameters. And a lot of today's, you'll see a lot of, lot more polypropylene and polyethylene develop in today's, uh, in today's world. Um, so another USP is that, and it's just super proud of, is that we're getting close to virgin-like properties. Um, when it comes to tensile strength elongation at break, um, you know, we get about 500% elongation at break. We get 14 MPA in tensile, uh, in tensile strength, um, uh, which is pretty decent for recycled material from the worst kind of plastic waste out there. So pretty proud of that. We also put this through like toxicity tests, um, you know, a REACH SVHC compliance test. This is European gold standard for like, you know, material toxicity and, you know, all of it passed with like, an ROHS is also another compliance test. Both of them, they're really expensive tests, these, and we were kind of, pushed by one of the one of our like grant givers to do this but i mean it's totally worth it uh, i'm glad we did it um uh and uh and yeah none of them were detected so it's like this is really clean material it's really consistent and it's of high quality um and it's more recyclable than the original so we're really excited about that and it's also really robust like we you know we're not picking and choosing mlp i think a lot of mlp recyclers today they also they are very like discriminatory okay you know, we only want this kind of mlp only pet pe uh, aluminum combination or only like this color only this uh, uh we're like no everything that's number seven right um can be and so this includes contamination from like if pet you know just pure pet seeks in hdp seeks into our uh, it, there's no issues even pvc gets separated out uh, with ps we're still having issues so with polystyrene hopefully we have to kind of remove that but all of the others there's some, you know, we, we think we can handle up to 10% of contamination but for PVC. This also includes like other really hard to recycle stuff like colored pet bottles, Tetra Pak, polycotton textiles, metallized paper plates, tissue dust hair. All of this gets removed. Um, you know, obviously stuff that has cellulose, we can handle only up to 10% contamination, which is actually fair, I think, because, you know, it's like not all of the set number seven has is Tetra Pak or is like has cellulose. It's, it's um, getting lesser and lesser. Um, so, but yeah, so it's very robust that we're also proud of. And this is just how it looks um, in the beginning. You know, this is how it, it you know, it's, it's, this is actually washed. It's much dirtier than this. Um, and after cleaning, we clean and shred it, which is not rocket science. But then after our chemomechanical extraction, we get polyolefins and we get the powder, of uh, the monomer of PET. And we compound this into polyolefins and then we repolymerize it as hyaluronic acid and PET. Um, and then into, into our first products. And these are obviously actual samples. Uh, um, and yeah, so, um, you know, the first product was our sun, recycled sunglasses, the beta version, which are not perfect. Uh, but we're really happy with the quality of the material. So if you ever buy these sunglasses and if you feel the material, that is really awesome. Sunglasses, we, we already have a second version of the, of the sunglasses coming out, like we're working on that like much more that we're, we'll be happier with both from manufacturing perspective and from like a finish perspective uh, uh, and also other designs that we're working on. But, um, but like the material we're really happy with. Um, and, it's, and also we don't do any greenwashing, right? Like, so it's 90% recycled, which is a true 90%. So this, in, this includes additives and compatibilizers. We add 10% of additives and compatibilizers. Um, and sometimes like more, many recyclers exclude additives in their calculation. Uh, we don't, uh, and we don't, right? I'm like, no, that's bullshit. You have to include all of the additives and the compatibilizers that you add. Um, and we also, uh, we don't add any conventional polymers, um, uh, you know, any conventional version to make it better, right? Like it's, it's, 90% MLP, and that's something that we're really proud of. And we, uh, my goal was like, oh, 50% be hogya, so we'll be very happy. Uh, but we had 90%, and when we got the results that we're getting, we we're super excited about it. Uh, um, and then also, there's a q cool QR code that tells you the story of how these sunglasses work. Cycle, I'll show you a video. This was really hard to get the damn QR code. We tried so many different printing methodologies, like, and inconsistently to get that to get it right, and to also um, make sure it scans the amount of scanners. Like I know all about QR scanners, and some of you all who have bought this, it might still not scan on some of your phones. And please tell me, we're trying to get this to be better and better, but uh, it's really hard to get a small QR code like that. Um, we're trying to make it bigger uh, and then put it somewhere, maybe on the inside. Some people are like it looks like a you know uh, a commercial corporate product, so we're gonna try and put the QR code on the inside. We're gonna do some cool things with that.
Um, and also, these are UV polarized lenses. I mean, they're not at the highest quality right now because we were just like, hey, we don't even know if people are going to buy these, but we're going to upgrade them to be even better quality lenses. But they're really good against the sun. So if you use them in the sun, they're really good. And also 10% of our sales go to waste picker empowerment initiatives to Swatch, uh, through Swatch Cooperative to keeping children of waste pickers in school. Um, that's really important for us. Uh, we also do end of life recycling. So these break, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll pay for the pickup and we'll recycle them in our lab. Uh, we're also neutralizing our footprint through climbs and Annie's going to hate me for this because we still haven't integrated it into our system. But, and for those who have bought sunglasses, we are going to neutralize them afterwards. Like if we're going to, we're going to do it offline and send you guys your climbs uh, through email uh, at some point so you can redeem them. So we will do it. We're just so backlogged. Like literally like nothing, it's nonstop. We didn't expect the, the response that we've gotten. But we're definitely new, uh, neutralizing. And now those orders have slowed down. Sales have slowed down. So we're like, Good and bad. Good is that we have time to breathe and the team's like, okay, we can take some time off and just kind of like take a break and then kind of go back to pushing uh, to get these orders out. We still have some 200 orders left to go out. So, uh, you know, uh, we're trying really hard to get those out as quickly as possible. Um, and, these are, and also these sunglasses aren't just a story. They're very functional. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you guys saw some of these videos, but we, uh, one sec, we drove a car over it. Um, and look, <laughs> nothing happened to them, right? So material is really durable and bendy and i was so paranoid about this um i didn't know if this was going to work but nothing happened to them uh, and uh, uh, and they bent okay they got a little deformed but you can always form them back so that was what was really cool about it so they're actually functional very functional it's good material we've gotten so much so many people are interested in this material and also like uh, the qr code this is the qr code if you scan the qr code um you get to see like where your waste came from uh, which waste pickers worked on it, um, how it was recycled, what your impact is. Um, so like, yeah, it's really cool because we have full vertical integration. We can do all this kind of stuff, you know, um, which makes things pretty cool. I mean, it's cool. Uh, uh, so yeah, so that's a little bit of material. Um, um, but I think what I want to end with is that we're not just making sunglasses, you know, and sunglasses are not going to solve the MLP problem or the plastic problem or the waste problem. It's just a proof of concept. Um, and, you know, we, we uh, and I, I was going to put another slide of how we chose sunglasses. We chose sunglasses. We, I think we brainstormed and got a list of 400 products. Uh, and then we like narrowed down to 70. And then we did like this complex, like really intense analysis where we looked at how difficult it was to make, you know, how many people are searching for this product on Amazon? What's the average margin on, on this? Like, what are the competitors? How many competitors do we have? You know, um, all of, and complexity, et cetera. We looked at lots of different things, uh, how excited we were as a team to, you know, to make these. And we landed on sunglasses because they were not so simple, like, you know, making coasters or making benches or you know, are generally simpler because, you know, almost any material can be used for some of that stuff. It's, I mean, if you put cement and silicon, it becomes easier. We wanted to kind of show off the properties that we have because sunglasses requires intricate intricacy and some finesse. So uh, we're like, okay, this is, uh, you know, uh, a little bit more complex. But also they were not so complex. Like, I know we were looking at solar-powered power banks at one point. Um, and solar-powered power banks were just uh, uh, so complex uh, with circuitry and stuff. So we ended up this being like, a, and plus it was a nice, like, I think people would be excited about, hey, these are sunglasses from Packets of Chips. And I think that, um, uh, so that's how we ended up making sunglasses. But that's really not the answer. That's just a proof of concept that kind of shows that you can take this waste that is considered impossible to recycle and make them into high quality products consistently, right? We're not just making five, uh, you know, we, we are doing this like in and just, there are various batches. It's not like we took one batch of MLP. Like we are just, it's, it's random MLP. We don't, we don't censor. Um, so uh, so yeah, it's just a proof of concept, you know. Our, our moat is actually the tech stack we're building. We're first, we have full vertical integration from waste to product. Um, and at each stage, we have technology that we're working on, which gives us a lot of flexibility uh, to not only recycle MLP, which is the start, but also other plastic waste and focus on high quality materials. Um, and um, um, so that's something that we're really excited about. And our long term goal is, is very different, right? Like we, you know, today's recycling um, and, and waste management is uh, generally centralized where you have these large factories that produce that recycle one type of waste, maybe, or, and that, um, or, or just maybe all plastic waste. Um, and I think while they're doing good work, I don't think that's necessarily the answer. I think one of the most important things is that how can you treat the waste as close to the source as possible? Like if you don't, like for instance, milk packets, you know, if it, after two or three days or after yeah, three, two or three, four, two, three, four days, I mean, it get, maggots get, you know, it gets full of maggots and becomes, it becomes starts, it starts rotting and starts getting really smelly. So the faster you recycle this or at least start processing it, the better it is. So that's what we want to try and build a more decentralized, small to medium recycling centers 
in every sub district and area in India that that process not just MLP or plastic waste, but all types of solid waste. Like I think wet waste is the biggest problem we have. Plastic waste isn't, I think, to me, the biggest problem in India. Um, sixty percent of it's recycled. Uh, wet waste, like only five or six percent is composted. It just sits, releases methane. It's just contaminated by plastic and metal and all of that. Um, you know, and and we haven't found a way to extract a lot of value from it. I think that's something we're also going to work on in the future. We think hopefully. Um, and then also like you're, you have to formalize and empower, empower the informal sector. That's crucial. Uh, and then you have to also make sure you're building financially sustainable manufacturing units. Like it's all nice to do cool recycling stories, but are they economically viable? Like our sunglasses have 70 to 80% gross margin, right? So, um, so it's like, yeah, this is viable at the sunglasses level. It might not be viable right now at the material level, but it is viable at the product level in some cases. So really focusing on finances as well is, is important. And then we want these decentralized material cradles to be supported by centralized R&D labs that, you know, that continue to innovate and distribute technology to material cradles. Um, and also like some of the processes like, like pet polymerization or maybe assembly or manufacturing, we can centralize, you know, because as long as the major steps are done in a decentralized fashion, you can start centralizing them. So that's something that we think could be interesting. Um, and we don't think we can do this alone, right? Like this is not like, oh, Achaya, uh, you know, it's, it's, we have to work together with other nonprofits, other social enterprises, other other, other for-profits, um, the government, um, you know, it, and we're really, we're truly an impact for a startup. Uh, um, anyway, so this is the first glimpse of, our, this is a little research cradle, uh, R&D lab in Pune. If anybody's in Pune, please come visit. We're very transparent and open. Uh, uh, and, you know, we have some toys, like, a, you know, we have some yes, twin screw extruder, autoclave, injection molding machines, and having a lab is really helpful. It allows, has allowed us to experiment rapidly. For instance, in the first year, we did close to a thousand experiments with an average of two, three hours, right? And these are not like, you know, fintech, like A-B tests you do, you change one word. These are like, you know, chemicals, glassware, machinery, you know, you don't know how many other variables, like so many confounding variables. So it's really hard. Um, and I think we've been able to make, it might seem like, oh, I know Anik used to keep like yelling at me, oh, get out, go, get out there, and get your product out. But it just took, it's taken us so long, but I think still think we've moved pretty fast uh, for the work that we've done. But, you know, that's, I mean, that's up for debate. Um, and we've actually scaled our technology from just like one, you know, this is actually a reactor uh, for our MLP recycling technology. It's not very complex. So, uh, and we do like five kilos in this. Uh, obviously, that's not a lot, but we want to scale to like 500 kilos or 100 kilos. And we think our reactor can, the reactor is scalable. So we were really excited when this happened. And yeah, and we're truly an impact for a startup. Like I, our lawyer was a little amused when we, we told him that I wanted, you know, I, I told him, I'm like, I want to amend our memorandum of association to legally bind us to an impact. Um, and so, you know, because my morality is not enough. Like it has to be bigger than any of us. Um, and then the metrics we want to hold ourselves accountable to in the long run is how many waste pickers do we permanently push out of poverty? Not like high level numbers, that's not going to solve the problem. It has to be long term, deep impact. And, and we're, I'm happy to start with a small number of waste pickers and really help go deeper and make sure that we're breaking them out of the cycle and then kind of scale that depth. And then obviously the waste impact, like a carbon avoided waste um, diverted. Um, uh, our philosophy on waste picker involvement is that right now we have six waste pickers that work with us, uh, but we only employ them part time because we don't, I mean, we're a startup and we, if we don't raise funding, then I don't know what's going to happen to us. So we don't want to promise them things we can't deliver and we want them to moonlight. We want them to like have other jobs so they can, you know, they can have other income. And also we believe waste pickers, we don't try to treat waste pickers better or worse. We just try to treat them like anybody else. And they work right alongside engineers and scientists, not above them, not below them. And that's what's really interesting. Um, and it's so, it's so sad that just by treating them like anybody else, they are like super shocked. They're like, wow, why, do, why are they treating us so nicely? And it's a sad reality. Um, so yeah, in our process, you know, we think they can do up to 50, 70% of the process and we're, we're training them and they do a lot of this uh, as well. Um, uh, so while we're figuring out the process, we're also making sure that anybody can do this, not just waste because like, even if you came down to a lab a couple of hours, we could train you and you all could do this. But we struggle sometimes because some of them can't treat properly. So we have to kind of figure out the right ways to do it. Um, so far, six waste pickers, they all earn two to three times more than what they were earning before, either total money or per hour money. 10% um, of our waste sales go towards the education of waste picker children. In the first 12 days, we have like, we did like seven, eight lakhs in sales. So we've got uh, about 70,000 rupees is, is, is going to go in donations. They haven't gone yet. They'll go soon. We just still, I still have to close the books. And I mean, my accountant is after me right now. I'll give me all the expenses. There's no time. Uh, we do pay a premium for the MLP waste, which goes directly to the waste picker collective. And we've, We've devoted 265 kilos of MLP from landfill so far. <laughs> That's not a lot. That's 53,000 packets of MLP. Uh, and anyway, so it's just the beginning. Uh, these are the three, uh, the six waste pickers that work with us. Um, uh, absolute legends. 
Um, so yeah, and and okay, look, we started off with just the two of us, Jitu and Anish, uh, uh, Jitu and me, and in February two thousand twenty-one is what we like to think. But let's say December two thousand twenty, like two years ago. Um, and now we are a whole bunch. So this is the team. Um, none of none of this is possible with, without everybody else. We as a team have really been able to um, uh, crack. Oh, I want to say crack. You know, just, we, you know, we've been able to get so far, and it's really awesome to have. Uh, a uh, good group of people around you, super committed, and I think what's universal about uh, all of us is that everyone's really, nice. everyone really cares about each other, and that's that's really important in our culture. Uh, and that's something that I've really learned, right? Like some some of the values, having uh, nice people, it really really helps, really really matters in the long run. Um, and uh, and sometimes we overweigh inte- intellect and intelligence and all of that. I think. Um, so yeah, we're a team of engineers, scientists, and operators. Uh, uh, some of the, uh, and uh, and this is just the start. Oh, we have a long way to go. I mean, sunglasses aren't solving anything. Um, so, you know, hopefully we can raise some money and hopefully we can, you know, go to the next stage. But yeah, so I've been babbling for a nice uh, 35, 40 minutes. I'll stop um, and I will, you know, if, um, if you guys have any questions, you know, please, um, I think you know, I'm happy to take Thank you, Anish, for the great story. Like, I think this was like a life story of your sunglasses we just heard. So it was great. Uh, you know, the goal knowing. was to tell you how we made sunglasses from MLP. Huh? That's what I was trying to, <laughs> trying to explain. Yeah, but introducing you to your friend Ashoka was great. So <laughs> I'm going to now stop um, the recording before we get to the questions.